guys, it's M4J here, and welcome back to the M4J network here on OpenTTD. This is uh, a very fast video, this one, it's in times four speed. Uh, actually, it's in times five speed, technically, because I've managed to get a two and a half hour video down to half an hour long. Uh, I'm quite proud of that myself. Uh, I say that like it's a big thing, but I just pressed times four on the editing software I use. The reason I had to cut it down so much is because it is a very big project that I did in the stream last week. If you did miss it for whatever reason, um, we rebuilt two freight terminals with a third one on the way. That'll be done off camera. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and yeah, basically we, we've just we've changed quite a lot of things in and around the northern part of Guard City here, uh, including the the high speed has changed slightly, the freight has changed slightly, the uh, the main line, the Great Northern and Grand Northern lines have changed slightly. There's quite a few little tweaks here and there that have gone on uh, throughout all of this. And the freight terminal, as I said, is completely different now. It looks completely different to how it's looked in the past. Uh, and I'm very, very happy with the results. Uh, I still haven't had the opportunity to test it yet because I'm still um, trying to get the, uh, the M4J rail freight livery into um, the game. Uh, for the mineral wagons but hopefully hopefully I can get my head around that this week and get those into the game and get it all tested because I have a horrible feeling still that this system that I've gone with for the freight terminal here isn't going to work uh, so to get it to work I mean I can in theory tweak the signals that I've already got without it causing a huge issue but it would still be nice if um, I could get it to work the way that I do want it to work so again for those of you who missed it Guard City North Freight Terminal has been kind of a thorn in my side for quite some time now. It's, it's looked really ugly, it's not really functioned very well. Um, I've not been a huge fan. So, uh, a few weeks ago now I had the idea of what if I was to completely change it and rebuild it uh, and make it look very nice and very lovely. I thought why not go ahead and do that. So I've been planning this for a little while. Had some ideas on how I wanted to do it. Very pleased to say that pretty much the idea that I had is what came to fruition so I'm very happy about that I am also a little bit concerned about the the um, bi-directional lines that I've got through the center here the ones that just dip through the tunnel there uh, mainly because I want to make sure that they actually work uh, and they don't get clogged up we've kind of got a one-way system for most of the outer platforms uh, for the freight terminal but the inner ones are all bi-directional and that's something else that I wanted to kind of bring over into a refined design um, from the previous terminal was this idea of trains can enter and leave in any direction if they need to use the loops at either end they will uh, but besides that there's no waypoints in here so once a train enters it'll just go through um, to whichever track it needs to go through according to what cargo it's carrying it'll load or unload and then it'll head out again that is the plan and that's hopefully what will happen uh, so this, yeah, sorry, I was just thinking what to say next. This is a good opportunity to talk about um, the new strategy for rail freight here on the network. So basically, there's two types of cargo, as far as I'm concerned. There's raw and there's manufactured. So raw is things like coal, iron ore, wood, uh, livestock, milk, um, bauxite, plant fibers, scrap metal, recyclables, that kind of thing. I mean, scrap metal technically is a manufactured product uh, if you use the um, criteria that I've been using. But let's just say for now, for the sake of argument, that it's a raw uh, product. Then you've got manufactured. Uh, and for manufactured, you have things like timber, steel, goods, food, building materials, uh, engineering supplies, farm supplies, and I think that's everything. Technically scrap metal as well because it comes from recyclables. Uh, the way the rail freight system is going to work is we're going to have raw and manufactured. Um, I've already made two liveries, one for each. Uh, so it, again, it's very nice, very lovely. Big fan of that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be using two locomotives at the moment to do most of the heavy hauling. One is the class 37. And the other one is the class 60, both of whom have uh, livery variants for um, passenger haulage plus 
raw material haulage plus um, manufactured goods haulage. So again, it's all it's all set up. It's all ready to go with deliveries. The only thing I'm waiting for right now is the livery for the um, the mineral wagons, which I talked about earlier. And once I've got those, then I can go ahead and uh, and add those to the game and be very happy. Um, I'm just talking about random stuff right now because I'm watching what I'm doing on the screen. Getting a little bit distracted. This is the high speed lines that I'm just rerouting here. Uh, it's it's not its own signal block now. It is still part of the, the signal blocks that you can see on the screen. So the tunnel going into Guard City St. George now is a lot shorter than it used to be, which is good because it means we can get more train cycling through in any given time. And these little crossover flyover bridge things we've got here as well. I, I wasn't convinced these were that realistic at first, but St. Pancras International technically has one where the javelins pass underneath the main running lines. Uh, so they go from the right-hand side running to the left-hand side running. And then join up with the um, the main running line just before the tunnel. It's kind of it's it's this on a curve basically. Uh, so I don't feel it's too unrealistic now. I feel like it's actually not too bad. Um, but yeah, going back to the freight strategy real quick. So we got raw and we've got manufactured, and that's that's basically how this is going to operate now. Uh, so we'll have trains running um, from their origin to a destination via at least one freight terminal somewhere along the map and in terms of um oh god i forgot what i was going to say then there's something really good so oh yeah sorry in terms of the guard city freight terminals north is going to be for raw materials only and south is going to be for manufactured only however there are going to be some exceptions so the canal that we built through guard city many many moons ago now does link north and south together that we will have barges and we will occasionally have train movements um, that will connect north and south together and that will be uh, the way that um, some raw materials for example will get between the two terminals so not every raw material train will come through north and not every manufactured train will come through south there will be some exceptions uh, but not too many if I can help it because I would like to keep the standard it's kind of why I've rebuilt this the way I have. So each each platform here now has a reason for existing. Um, and yeah, it just it makes my life a little bit easier. Now, of course, something else to bear in mind is a lot of my trains I set to auto refit. So it could well be that a train arrives at the coal platforms carrying coal, unloads, and then fills up with iron ore or wood. Uh, although I don't think wood's possible. What else? Plant fibers, let's say, which is a different set of platforms to the coal ones. Uh, that's something that I'm just going to have to say, you know, deal with it. Uh, it's something I'm going to have to deal with because I'm not a big fan of that idea myself. But I want trains to auto refit because you don't always have... Sometimes, like, I mean, back in the 80s, you did just have trains that carried coal. And you did just have trains that carried goods, for example, in containers. But um, the way I want my network to run is I don't want six different types of raw material service going to Sindwood, for example. I'd rather have one or two from different terminals across the map. Or at least I don't want them all going from Guard City to Sindwood. I might have one that goes from Monopole Falls to Sindwood. I might have one that goes from um, Lanningway, which doesn't have any raw materials right now, but let's just say for the sake of argument. From Lanningway up to Sindwood, that kind of thing. I don't want the same... I don't want like six services using the exact same route even if they're all carrying different things. That seems a bit pointless. So I'd rather have, you know, a train arrives here, drops off whatever it brought from the coal mine or the iron ore mine, then picks up whatever it needs to take onto its next destination. And the idea is to try and make the freight sector a bit more profitable, because right now it's a huge loss maker. Uh, so trying to make it make money, basically, is, is the objective right now. Um, and in, in order to do that, every single freight train that was previously on the network has gone. It's been sold. Uh, and I'm going to reboot, rejig, redo and try and make it profitable. And that's kind of the objective for um, the whole network now is because I've had, I've had a few people comment in streams and stuff about um, how come I have so much money in the game. Uh, I've answered that question to death so I'm not going to answer it again here. But they make a very good point of um, it's not really a challenge if you've got so much money. It's not really a challenge to try and make money and be profitable. And uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing with unlimited money. You know, I am still watching it constantly tick down. And I do get a little bit of anxiety from that. But at the same time, I do have quite a nice big buffer. 
but that doesn't mean I don't want it to be profitable. So I am constantly looking at it and making sure that you know services are making money. And I was quite critical of the GWR not long ago because it wasn't making any money. However, now that the full service pattern has been reinstated, it is actually making money. So um, it's quite satisfying to see that in fact and again a couple of weeks ago on stream I wasn't sure how much money it was actually making but uh, it seems to be like 14 million during the day which I mean imagine if you ran a company that made 14 million pounds in a day that'd be quite impressive wouldn't it um, but yeah that's something else I wanted to talk about actually, two things I wanted to talk about one's to do with electrification in the UK the other one's to do with hydrogen in the UK uh, I'll go on to those in a second. But one thing I wanted to start off with here is uh, ticket pricing in OpenTTD. Now, I mentioned this on stream last week, I think, or the week before, and someone asked on my behalf on the Reddit, I believe it was. Uh, but they asked about, is there a new GRF that uh, changes ticket prices? And new GRFs tend to be aesthetic. You've got things like furs and um, fish and chips. Really weird names, but I won't go into that. That, that do change the behavior of the game so they introduce new cargo types for example and new industries but what I was thinking more was a patch where it can identify what type of carriage you've got on your train and add like a multiplier to the cargo rate to match it so for example if I was to run a budget train from Gronwell which is right up in the northeast of the map to Sanley which is right down in the southwest and it kind of snaked its way through different areas, stopping off at key locations, places like Barthurst Street, uh, Denston, Drentbourne, things like that. Um, that probably wouldn't make much money on its own because it's carrying cargo at a very slow speed and you know not exactly delivering it quickly. However, if I used first class carriages, so it wouldn't be a budget service anymore, it would be a luxury train. Or you know, if I used sleeper carriages and turned it into a sleeper service, it would be really cool if there was a patch that could identify that and add like a, a cargo price modifier according to what carriage, you know, according to what rolling stock you're using basically. So if I used all first class carriages, maybe it would take that price and times it by one and a half. Um, if I used all second class carriages, then just give me the normal price, for example. I, I think that might be possible. It's not a new GRF though, it would be a patch. So it would be something like scheduled dispatch with departure boards. Um, it wouldn't be something like, you know, BR trains, for example. Um, and I think that would be doable. I have no idea how I would do it myself. I would need someone a lot smarter uh, than I am to help me out with it. But I reckon there's something in that. I reckon that would be quite a cool feature to add to the map. Because you know how I feel about budget rail. I'm a big fan of it. So it would be really cool if... Um, if I could find a way to integrate it into the network. Uh, and actually, this episode is being premiered tonight. Uh, so you guys will be hopefully watching in the chat. Uh, I'm a little bit... I premiered my City Skylines video yesterday. And then there was only one person in the chat. And even then, it wasn't that active. So I'm kind of already starting to doubt whether or not this is a viable thing to do. And considering most people who answered the survey did ask for videos to be premiered. Uh, that is cause for concern that people aren't actually turning out and watching it. Uh, first video of every month, just so you guys remember. First video of every month will be a premiere. So um, keep that in mind. Um, it'll be great to see as many people as possible coming along and watching. Um, but yeah, to go back to subject, I think uh, again, I think it's doable to have something that will adjust the payment rates. And it, it's not it's not changing how much passengers uh, pay or anything like that. It simply takes the amount that that train earns and say applies a times two modifier to it that's all I'm asking it to do really um, and because each carriage type particularly for BR trains now I've had a look at the code I can see that you know different carriages have different ID numbers and things uh, or maybe not ID numbers but different identifiers I think it is possible to find something that can read that and detect what type of carriage you're using um, because there, I mean there are some that running costs for example is, is done by carriage type so if I use the Mark 1's right now they, it uses the um, steam steam running costs whereas if I use Mark 2's onwards it uses diesel or electric uh, so it does know and it can alter the running cost according to what type of carriage you're using so there must be a way to do it by like first second class as well 
Um, we'll see. We'll see. But I really like that idea. Uh, again, it will, it will encourage budget rail, which is something I'm a big fan of. But yeah, the second thing I wanted to talk about. So, hydrogen. Uh, there's been some government announcements lately from the DFT, Department of Transport, for those of you who don't know, about hydrogen-powered trains. And they've already started designating branch lines that could potentially be operated by hydrogen-powered trains. Now, I think this is a step in the right direction, don't get me wrong, but I think this is something that a lot of people overlook, is it's great that we're moving away from diesel, um, and especially electrifying certain routes around the UK is something that I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, but the hydrogen one still gets me a little bit worried because this was a few years ago now by the way so it might not necessarily be this uh, the same case anymore but many years ago now um, James May did a, a TV show called Cards of the People uh, and he also did one called and I'm trying to remember the name of it uh, Big Ideas I think it was and it was in one of those shows that he was talking about hydrogen powered vehicles and he said that's all well and good except the amount of energy required to isolate hydrogen because it's normally done from water you take water and you take out the oxygen and you just leave the hydrogen the amount of energy it takes to do that was greater than the amount of energy you got from the hydrogen you know it was an inefficient system um, you know it's not a closed loop as it were so what worries me about hydrogen fuel cells right now is are we at a stage where it's more energy efficient to use hydrogen I don't think we are yet I don't think we are because in order to isolate let's say it takes I'm gonna make up some numbers here let's say it takes um, I'm trying to remember what the unit of power is it's watts isn't it let's say it takes five watts to isolate hydrogen like one gram of hydrogen and that one gram of hydrogen can power or could provide two watts worth of power you're already at a, almost a half loss in fact over a half loss in terms of the energy and that energy has to come from somewhere what are you using to power the machine that uh, isolates the hydrogen is it electricity nine times out of ten it will be in which case where's your electricity coming from is it coming from a nuclear power station is it coming from a coal power station is it coming from a hydroelectric dam where's your power coming from power cannot be energy sorry cannot be gained or lost it can only be converted so if you're taking hydropower and you're converting it into electrical energy which can then be used to isolate hydrogen that's one thing if however you're using coal burning then it's still not beneficial to the environment. Likewise with electric traction, if you're electrifying all these other routes around the UK, it's well known that we've had problems in the past electrifying routes and upgrading existing electrified routes to be able to sustain the trains. Um, and by that I mean like the East Coast Main Line needed to be upgraded for the Yazumas. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the new electrification on the Great Western is more powerful than the existing electrification on the Great Western so that will probably need to be upgraded as well these new trains draw a lot of power uh, where does that power come from here in the UK most of our power stations are fossil fuel still in France a lot of their power stations are nuclear that's why they had such a, an extensive high-speed rail network as well because they could power it using nuclear energy um, so the TGV project when that was first started that, you know, the catalyst for that was the nuclear power. They were able to sustain it. Over here in the UK, we've got things like Drax Power Station, which burns biomass. Uh, most of our nuclear power stations have all closed down now. They've been decommissioned. Um, I think we've still got some coal burning stations somewhere in the UK as well. And the majority of our clean energy either comes from Scotland and the wind farms they've got up there and the hydroelectric farms they've got up there, or we buy it from France and their nuclear power stations. So if we're continuously upgrading our, our railways uh, to be electrified, where is the energy actually coming from? We have to buy energy from France for the ad breaks during Coronation Street because it, when everyone turns the kettle on at the same time, it could black out the entire country. And that sounds like a joke, but that's genuinely serious. It, it's like a 5% increase in energy usage or something. Something like that. It used to be 5%. It might even be higher now um, for the entire country, which is a big number. When you think about it, it's 55 million, 60 million people living here. 
that is a big number. So we, we basically have to buy surplus energy from France and other countries in Europe in order to be able to sustain that. Uh, and that's for a short period of time. Imagine if we electrified six or seven more main lines in the UK. Where are we going to get the power from to power trains on there 24-7? Vast infrastructure improvements required, methinks. Uh, and I'm not being critical of the idea. I think it's good that we're moving towards a cleaner solution for powering trains, because that's one less thing for the critics to argue about. Uh, and I'm always in favour of one less thing for the critics to argue about. Uh, but, but, you know, even when High Speed 2 gets built, how are we going to power that? If the um, Northern Powerhouse gets built, how are we going to power that? If all these other routes around the UK are going to get electrified. You don't want to add fuel to the fire, particularly when you're talking about fossil fuels. You definitely don't want to add fuel to that fire. So I think um, biomass burns cleaner than coal, which I think is the reason why Drax was converted from coal to biomass. So that's step one. But if we're still generating power from burning things, then we haven't really learnt from our uh, primitive ancestors, have we? Um, you know, fire fire be good and all that. Sometime, at some point, we're going to have to realise that there are other better ways to generate electricity. Um, I was watching a video about Disney World recently, Walt Disney World in Florida, they have two big solar farms, one in the shape of Mickey Mouse's head, the other one, I'm trying to remember what it's in the shape of, uh, I think it's just a big square, but both of those combined can power two of the four theme parks at Walt Disney World, which means clean energy. And because Walt Disney World is its own jurisdiction, it's not governed by Florida, it's not governed by Orlando, they have their own um, jurisdiction, Reedy Creek. Uh, you know, they can build these big energy saving projects and they also have solar panels on the roofs of some of their rides at Epcot, which help power it. And I think maybe that's a solution we should look towards, putting solar panels on the roofs of stations. Uh, not so much to power the trains, but to power the stations, which means there's less energy draw there, which means more power can be provided to the track. Um, that's a good solution. Also, maintenance depots, having them be powered by solar or wind. Um, little, little changes like that can go a long way. I'm wondering how feasible it will be to put solar power uh, solar panels on the tops of trains. So, in Australia there is a solar powered train, but it doesn't run very far. I think it's like a two mile shuttle. I'm saying like getting an, getting Azumas putting solar panels on the roof and trying to use that to power things like the plug sockets under your seat, um, and then save the overhead electrification for the traction motors. That might again be a better solution because a lot of the power that gets drawn from the overhead wiring goes towards things like heating, air conditioning, catering, um, reading lights. It sounds really dumb, again, to say it like that, but it's true. And the traction motors do still draw the vast majority in total, but um, more than you think goes towards powering the amenities rather than the actual train. So I think if we can find solutions to um, sort of take the stress out of the, uh, the electrification, um, and may make that focus entirely on, on actually powering the train, maybe with a backup system, so if the solar panels aren't working for whatever reason, then the overhead wires will also power the uh, the plug sockets, etc. Uh, I think that could also be a good solution. Again, someone much cleverer than me uh, will probably tell me that that's not doable for whatever reason. Um, I mean, high speed one might be tricky with all the tunnels in and out of Stratford, but even then, like if you put capacitors somewhere, not so much batteries, but capacitors, uh, which is what they use in the roller coaster industry to power the trains there. So you've got like lights and sound systems and things like that on roller coaster trains, and a lot of those are powered by capacitors. So there'll be a charging point in the station, and it gives the train enough power to last 10, 15 minutes. And considering a cycle on most coasters is normally two to three minutes, that's that's more than enough time. So maybe if you chuck some capacitors down somewhere as well, without adding too much to the weight of the train, because that becomes energy inefficient, uh, then you can while it's under the overhead it's either charging from solar panels or it's charging from the wires and then once it goes into a dead spot excuse me once it goes into a dead spot like a tunnel for example then um, it will start drawing power from the capacitors instead you could mainly say that the capacitors will be there so if the train like if the uh, the wiring goes down in the tunnel there'll be enough power for the train to um, pull out of the tunnel so people can be evacuated safely. Uh, that won't apply for the Channel Tunnel, mind. I'm talking about the, the Javelins rather than the Eurostars. Because I think the, the Eurostars, based off the TGV, they're quite energy efficient anyway. Uh, or the, sorry, the three th seven, 
373s are based off the TGV, the 374s are based off the Valaro, both of which are quite modern. Um, I mean, they were, they were advanced for their time when they were first designed, and even now they're still quite modern, and they've been upgraded and stuff over the years too. But yeah, I'm mainly talking about the Javelins, uh, which I I kind of knew this because I've travelled on them so many times, but I was watching a trip review on them, and they are basically just regional trains. They don't have many fancy bells and whistles or anything. It's all, you know, there's, there's no phone chargers, there's no first class or anything like that. And you think about what they are, they're high-speed trains. You know, they're basically, they were the fastest commuter trains in the country. In fact, they still are technically the fastest commuter trains in the country. Uh, and in fact, they are still the fastest non-international trains in the country because the Azumas don't go 140 miles an hour yet. Maybe they will once the East Coast Main Line's upgraded, but right now they don't. So, um, they're very basic for what they are. I do find that quite surprising still. I suppose it's just one of those things. But yeah, um, there's my ideas for energy solutions here in the UK for, for keeping these routes electrified and upgrading more to be electrified. Uh, let me know what you think, either in the chat or in the comments down below. Some people probably won't agree. Uh, most people probably won't agree. I think that's fair. It's just one of those things. Um, I know that in the chat there'll be someone saying yeah but and I'm kind of prepared for that it's um, it's that typical thing and I, I've mentioned this before there's no real right or wrong answer there's just ideas and eventually an idea will get selected and it'll either work or it won't but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad idea it could just be badly executed and that's that's a mantra that I've carried through most of my life there's no such thing as a bad idea only bad execution um, and boy, have I met people who know how to badly execute an idea. Uh, it's just, again, it's one of those things, really. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to see hydrogen-powered trains in the future. I think it is possible. I know that in Germany they've been trialling it. And I know that, um, I think in Switzerland as well, they've been trialling it. And over here in the UK, we've got uh, Porterbrook, who are working on a 319 design uh, in collaboration with a company that I can't remember the name of right now. Oh, Orion. That's the one. Um, I'd like that to work. And actually, Orion are the cargo carriers, I think. So maybe not Orion. Anyway, th there's, a, there's a 319 that's being converted to um, hydrogen powered. And I know that the D train can also be converted to hydrogen. And that's the one I favor the most because it's modular still. So you'll take out the diesel generator and you'll replace it with a hydrogen fuel cell. So all the, uh, the inner workings, all the electric... Uh, all the electrics, all the power supply and everything will stay the same. It's literally just what's producing the power that changes. And I really like that, actually. That that in itself is simplicity made genius. Uh, the fact that you can make a train that is modular. So that, that basically means a train in the morning, it will pull out of the depot with a diesel generator. And then halfway through the day, it might return to the depot. They'll pull off the generator. They'll put on the hydrogen fuel cell. I think they said it takes 45 to 90 minutes to switch it over. And then it could operate a different service in the evening on a different main line using hydrogen power instead that is so clever that is so clever why why is that not like the standard across the country why is that only new and i'm not talking about hydrogen here i'm talking about things like why do we not have a train that can use diesel power uh in one part of the day and then a battery in the other part of the day and don't talk to me about bi-mode trains because that's not the same thing that is uh you know it, it literally uses Technically, it uses both for some periods of time. Whilst the pantograph's going up and down, it is using the diesel engine. And I, I actually think the Azumas, for example, and the well, the IETs, the Intercity Express trains, the diesel engine is running idle when it's not being used. It only fires up, as it were, when the pantograph is activated or deactivated. But I think the engine is always running, but just in a, a slow mode. Because I imagine it would cause quite a lot of issues if it's bombing along at 125 miles an hour the electrification runs out and the engine doesn't start that would be very awkward uh, but yeah as I said that, that those are my ideas some people might agree some people might not agree uh, in terms of the freight there will be more coming to it in the future there will be more freight terminals being built I've kind of identified the site for Gronwell now uh, and that will use the Grand Northern and the North Valleys route to run into um, uh, uh, Sindwood I forgot the name of it and then down to Guard City and places like that there will be some trains that run uh, origin, terminal, destination. There will be some trains that will just run origin, terminal. There will be some trains that will just run terminal, destination. Very much depends on, on the logistics, what needs to be where and how. 
But yeah, that pretty much does it for this episode, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. And of course, if you enjoyed the series. Uh, hopefully, it's an active chat. I'd, I'd love it to be an active chat. Uh, if not, we'll have to see what happens next month. But yeah, drop some comments down below with ideas for future episodes. Also, check out the Discord and the Reddit. Besides that, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button. If you have already subscribed to the channel, thank you guys for your continued support. And until next time, I will see you on Thursday for the stream. And I will also see you soon.